Our region's business is sponsored by PNC for the achiever in you. Our region's business. Innovation, transformation, momentum. Improving our communities and driving technologies that will shape our region for generations. The collaboration that brings vitality, prosperity, and life to living. Stay with us for the coming half hour as we examine in depth our region's business. Now, here's your host, Bill Flanagan. Today on Our Region's Business, shining a light on the future of solar energy in our region. We'll find out how Phipps Conservatory is counting on the sun to power its new education center, one of the first living buildings in the world. And we'll meet the owner of a local company that's testing multiple solar solutions on its rooftop just outside the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, but first, the challenges in harnessing the solar energy source, especially when the sun don't shine. Uh, Dr. Gregory Reed is director of the Power and Energy Initiative and professor of the Swanson School of Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Hi, Bill. Good to see you. Yeah, a lot of excitement about the future. Certainly, we've been uh, from time to time on this program covering all the different energy industries that right. are present in the region. But a lot of hopes for the future uh, uh, for sunshine because obviously it seems to be free power. Uh, and so at that level, uh, it's, it's a tempting, tempting resource. But right. it also poses a lot of questions for how the whole energy dynamics of our economy work. That's right, it really does. There's a lot of issues around not just solar, but other forms of renewables like wind in terms of their intermittency, the statistic nature of them, and how do we integrate them into the grid, which really wasn't built you know, a half a century ago to handle these types of resources and to move them around to where we use electricity in an effective manner. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because you think of the grid, I mean, it's been mostly run, I guess, on coal primarily right. and a significant amount of nuclear from uh, in the last 50 years or so. But why, why do wind and solar in particular sort of challenge the system and the way it currently works? Well, when you look at the, the base load that we have historically, traditionally, and today, with coal and nuclear, other fossil forms of energy, it's very stable in terms of its production and how we dispatch it into the grid. So we know it's gonna be there and we can rely on it. And so we have processes and systems in place to handle how we very economically and effectively get energy into the grid from the production resources and then transmit it and distribute it to our end use uh, locations. With renewables, you can't always predict very well uh, when you're going to have it and to what levels of intensity. Uh, as you were saying, the sun doesn't always shine uh, all the time and the wind isn't always at its highest penetration all the time. In fact, in some cases, it's just the opposite of when we need it. Hmm. Uh, the wind tends to pick up, for example, more in the nighttime when our loads are down. That's not such a problem with sun, but you know, even clouds coming overhead, it creates all of this intermittency. And that's really the, the, one of the biggest issues is how to deal with the intermittency to get it into the grid more stably. But the other issue with it that we're trying to resolve is the locations of a lot of the highest penetrations. So if we look at it on a, on a national level, most of the highest penetrations of solar are in the southwestern states. And for the wind, it's in the plain states and, and off of the shores. And if you look at where we use electricity, where our main population centers are, we tend to be built up around the coastlines and the Great Lakes. So to get that energy to where we use it is right now a big challenge for us. So that becomes a long distance transmission. Which takes us back to the days exactly. of George Westinghouse and Nikola Tesla when they started the whole alternating current thing here in our region. That's right, which is a great and rich history, a very colorful one. Uh, not everyone, but most people know about the old AC versus DC wars at the turn of the 20th century. And back then, uh, Westinghouse had come up with a way to transmit electricity along with Tesla over AC lines, which made it possible to produce energy in one location and, and move it long distances. The problem at that time with DC, which Edison was pushing, was that you had to build a power station every several miles because you couldn't transmit it very effectively. We built up the majority of our electricity networks in this country and in Europe and other parts of the world predominantly through the 1930s and 1970s, and we used AC technology. Something that changed in the early 70s was the advent of power electronics technologies, the transistor, which we now use at very high power capacity levels today for large-scale electric transmission. So we're looking today at the turn of this 21st century at really going back to DC because it gives us a new opportunity to transmit energy from these remote locations over long distances with DC, which has a lot of advantages. 
in terms of the amount of capacity of energy that we can move through a given corridor as compared to AC with fewer losses, lighter infrastructure. So it has a lot of benefits um, economically as well as in the way that we control power delivery. We can get much more precise control using these power electronics technologies by transmitting it over DC lines as compared to just all AC. Fascinating. Well, an AC also is built on huge centralized generating stations, right. right? But if you're talking windmills spread along the entire coastline or solar panels all over the place, all of a sudden the power force, uh, power sources are scattered all over the That's place. That's right. That's right. So, so again, we're going to have to move these resources uh, over long distances to get them to where we use them. And the other aspect of this, because a lot of people ask us, why DC now? all these years later over AC is apart from the high voltage transmission system, if you look at what's happening at the end use level, look around your studio, uh, your, your television screens, um, your computers, look around your office or your home, uh, your, your computers on your desktop, uh, some of your LED lighting, more and more of what we use at the end use level is low voltage DC. Hmm. And we continue to plug it into a 120 volt legacy outlet with all these converters around. And those converters create heat and loss. So we're looking ultimately at a paradigm shift here where more and more of our total infrastructure can be all DC. And if you look at things like resources, solar is inherently a DC resource. So we don't have to convert that from the, cells, from the sun. It's coming out as DC. So that right. means you go buy the new appliance or, or the new electronic gadget, you wouldn't have that big block to plug into the wall anymore. You just have a plug that would go right into a DC jack. Someday. Ideally, and that's yeah. what, that's some of the things that we're working in my research group in the lab on, and working with a lot of industry organizations who are also looking at this and, and seeing a bright future for it. Well, really fascinating. I think of the hundreds of companies around here that make parts for things. It seems like this could be a huge new opportunity for them, you know, uh, in the in the decades ahead. Absolutely. You know, the companies that we partner with, you know, um, Eaton and, and uh, ABB and Mitsubishi Electric and others, are all looking at this DC infrastructure. And our school's namesake, uh, John Swanson, Dr. John Swanson, Swanson School of Engineering, ha has been very interested in tapping the sun and the solar energy. He certainly, as we all do, see it as a longer term uh, aspect of, of energy sustainability. So hmm. we have a lot of uh, tremendous support and inspiration really with our work and in sort of driving not just an opportunity for a national agenda around this, but the opportunity for our region to grow with it. Wow, um, really terrific stuff. Great to see it all happening here in the region, providing the leadership as we have for about 150 years That's in this right. space. Dr. Greg Reed from Pitt, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thanks, Bill, it's always great to be on your show. And next up, testing solar solutions on a rooftop right here in our region. Stay with us.